Mm. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter, and um, thank you for the invitation. I was a little hesitant uh, in accepting because um, I didn't know what sort of talk you'd expect. It's many, many years since I hung up my slide rule. Uh, it's, in fact, I was just reflecting, it's 50 years since I started at the University of Sydney at the age of 16, would you believe, having just left school and started an uh, honours course in science. We had two weeks in those days to decide whether to do honours or a pass level in physics, mathematics, pure mathematics, physics, mathematics, pure and applied mathematics and um, uh, chemistry. And um, you, if you didn't elect to do honours, you could never go on to do honours and never do a PhD in that field. And I think that's a lot of pressure for a 16-year-old, although what I consider some of our students today, I, I think, well, maybe it wasn't a bad system. We had a good way of separating the good from the not more average. Anyway, um, 50 years and at the University of Sydney, it was a very different world. I'm going to talk about why I, a little bit about me and why I ended up doing the sort of work I do, which I still love and I'm still passionate about, um, and how my training in mathematical statistics in particular and science in general uh, helped to shape the way I think and the way I select problems and the people I work with. So um, that's the background and I've used the word errant because I think it's at least 20 years since I dropped my membership of the Statistical Society of Australia. I, the, the blue journal each month wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't reading it. I figured uh, it's not worth it. <laughs> uh, but um, so I became very out of touch for a long time, particularly after I went to Griffith, which is not noted for its strengths in statistical um, mathemati mathematical statistics. I actually hadn't realised before I went to Griffith how little math stats went on there. Uh, and I've done a little bit in the intervening years to strengthen uh, at least the uh, applied stats side of things. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So what I'm going to do is give you just one or two case studies of the sort of work that I've done over the years and why I've used data and the sorts of problems I've used uh, statistical methods with. Uh, and then I, I have a few random reflections on the future of your profession, if you're a statistician. I, I have, I've been thinking about this for many years. I still worry about statistics in Australia because it's experienced a truly precipitous decline, uh, it, both in popularity and I think in um, depth, since uh, at least in a very narrow area, uh, since I was an undergraduate and a postgraduate. We can perhaps debate that a little later on. I have some suggestions and some, I have a vision for the future that involves this discipline. Uh, it's not a complete vision, so you need to help me fill it out. So that's my preamble. Sometimes in my lectures, my preambles go for half a lecture because I try and engage with students, you know, and I have the endless temptation to tell anecdotes and stories, which all the students say makes the lecture more fun, but it means I don't get through the content and then they complain. Um, so my career focus, which I cut and pasted from my CV because I wondered what it was these days, but here it is. The, uh, the theoretical analysis of crime, violence and related social problems that I have published on corruption. I, be, I was for five years a commissioner of the Queensland Criminal Justice Commission in the heady days of the 1990s. Um, and uh, I learned a few things in that context, I can tell you. And a few things I can't talk about since it's against the law. So the analysis of these sorts of problems and the prevention of these problems through the application of the scientific method to problem analysis and the development, implementation and evaluation of interventions. Ever since I started work, uh, actually getting paid a full-time salary outside of a university, I've had this passion for prevention. Uh, and I'll, my first case study is going to be about that. In fact, these days I would identify primarily as a prevention scientist and I just copied that. That's a picture of the front of the Prevention Science Journal uh, and I go to their conference most years in the US. Um, heavily statistical, heavily health science based but starting to get into even more interesting problems like crime and violence. <coughs> now that's my first publication, well one of my first publications. It was in the Indian Journal of Statistics, Sankhya. Uh, series B in those days and on the left there's a face some of you would recognise, that's Professor John Robinson who was my, um, my supervisor for my master's thesis. Uh, I did a master's by research um, and with a view to going on to do a PhD um, but I elected not to. Uh, so I finished the master's and we published it. 
Now, I, I was looking through this today. I actually downloaded it from Sankir. It's with all the back copies are there. <coughs> I have no idea what this is about, really. I really can't. And it just gets worse and worse. That's just the first page. Um, John was a great supervisor, as many of you know. He's the, I think, the older brother of William Robinson, who has his uh, paintings in the gallery here. And there's a wonderful painting of, um, but done by William Robinson of both him and John, John and his full academic regalia. I've got very warm memories of John, and in fact, a friend of mine, Murray Cameron, who was in my honours year, who was former director of mathematics and statistics at CSIRO, now retired in Sydney, he's organising a get-together of the honours year of 1969. Uh, and uh, John has agreed to come, so I'm looking forward to catching up with him again. Um, I have very warm memories of the quality, the depth of supervision at the University of Sydney, but it was in an extraordinarily narrow field. And when I got outside, I, I, I made this... I, I was 22, I think, by the time this thing came out. No, actually it came out when I was a bit older, but by the time I'd finished all the work. And I thought, I can't keep doing this. I'm not interested enough in this sort of work or even in what other people around the place are doing to do this for, for the rest of my life. And I think that's a tragedy and I think it's a missed opportunity. What I had to do when I went out to work uh, in the uh, New South Wales <coughs> Public Service the year after that uh, was solve a lot of uh, data analysis problems, but I'd never been taught to do it. And this is actually, this article was published in the same year as the Sankir article. And it was a product of work I'd started to do with my boss, uh, who was a man called um, Dr. Tony Vinson, V-I-N-S-O-N. Some of you may have heard of him, although he's much more well-known in New South Wales. Um, and what we... Tony was a social worker, but also a sociologist, and he was passionate about the use of um, quantitative methods to analyse problems and then to devise solutions. You, you begin to see a connection between what I said were my interests and what he did. And I sat at his feet, as it were, and learned. He was a very naive young man. I was a statistician working in the Bureau of Crime Stats. In fact, we were setting it up. And it's still going under the directorship of a man called Don Weatherburn, who's frequently in the press, if you read the National or Sydney Press, usually arguing with the government about get-tough policies and presenting evaluations, very rigorous evaluations of various policies. Just today, um, in the paper, there was an article about... Um, the bad government closing down a, uh, the drug courts, even though a very good evaluation has shown that it works on every single measure that they could come up with. Uh, so that's a big difference, actually, I would say, between now and the 1970s, because there was a really naive belief in the, in the 1970s, including amongst the politicians who were setting these research institutes up, that we could do something constructive using evidence just to tackle problems like... Now, in the, the early 1970s, crime was a growing problem. The post-war, the baby boomers, you know, were young and uh, breaking a lot of laws. And it was a time of um, just after the Vietnam era, drugs were around. Uh, you know, it was a very interesting period of history. Uh, anyway, this was an article which was published in a very prestigious journal, the British Journal of Criminology. And um, so, as I said, this is, this is the direction I decided to go in. But, and there's Tony. He's... Um, he did run the New South Wales Corrective Services, uh, tried to create civilised environments within New South Wales prisons. Uh, I don't think he would say that he fully succeeded in that, in, in that period, but he did that after I worked with him at the Bureau. Um, and uh, he's a quite extraordinary man, and he's a man who had an enormous influence on me uh, as a, in the directions that I've already indicated. Now, what we did in that article in the British Journal of Criminology was... Um, and I'm getting to a point here... It was a very simple analysis in many respects. Uh, it was taking a whole lot of social indicators at, a, at an aggregate level, at a local government area level, for the city of Newcastle, actually the suburb level, uh, and looking at their distribution uh, across the whole of the city and looking at the correlations. And the argument of the, ar of the article was that there's a coincidence between medical and social and crime problems in a small number of localities. And uh, I didn't believe this, actually, at the start. Um, but what I did, dutifully, was do an analysis. I, I just did a principal components analysis. And uh, uh, there was a very dominant first uh, factor, a general dimension of risk or social disadvantage that came out. And this graph on the bottom just um, arranged all of the suburbs. I forget how many, many there were now in those days in Newcastle, city of Newcastle in uh, New South Wales. Uh, but 
sure enough, as Tony had predicted, there were a small number that stuck out like a sore thumb, way, way greater levels of concentrated disadvantage uh, on all the indicators we looked at uh, than the great majority at the other end. So very skewed distribution, but it was more than skewed. You actually had almost two discrete groups. So as he had hypothesised, based on his long experience as a probation officer and as a social worker, uh, there really were, even in those days, an emerging social divide between the underclass, uh, who ended up in prison, incidentally, at very high rates, and um, all the rest of the, the increasingly prosperous Australian population. Now, one of the little things I did, being a naive young man, I thought, well, we better do this another way and see if we can um, get a valid or robust result. And I'm not sure you can see that graph on the bottom. I talked to, to friends in the CSIRO um, who were using cluster analysis to um, analyse usually ecological data. And uh, this was a dendrogram that we drew. Based, and I wouldn't have a clue now how to do this sort of thing. But uh, essentially we were able to, again, group the great majority of suburbs into one low-risk category. And there were a small number of very high risk. And they were almost exactly the same. Anyway, we presented these results at the end of the year, 1972, to a branch meeting, New South Wales branch meeting of the Statistical Society of Australia. And I thought this was an interesting example of what one of their graduates was doing, and Tony came along with me. And it was an interesting meeting because uh, at the end, my professor, Henry <laughs> Oliver A. Lancaster, got up, and there he is, uh, looking very serious in that photograph. He was, he was mostly very serious. Who's heard of H.O. Lancaster? Yeah. I think he, at that time, had come up with six of his seven proofs of um, the Pearson chi-square uh, and just published his book on chi-square. But, of course, he was very famous. He had three doctorates. He was, he was doctor of um, medicine, doctor of mathematics, and doctor of the university. Um, and uh, very distinguished and, oh, super smart man. I remember doing one of his honours courses... Um, for the, he never spoke, he never faced the students. You always saw his dust jacket, at the, the back of his dust jacket, and he wrote on the blackboard and talked, uh, mumbled actually. And for the first three or four weeks of his course, I had no idea um, what he was talking about. It was on Bunnock spaces and Hilbert spaces and the connections back to analysis of variance. And then gradually the light dawned and suddenly I could see this is the most brilliant stuff I've ever heard in my life. I've never heard anybody in this department expound those mathematical and statistical connections so clearly. It was beautiful. I think I did quite well in that course. So I'm, I don't mean any criticism of Henry Oliver, who of course is now deceased. But at the end of our talk that year, uh, in 1972, to the Statistical Society, he got up and said, we can't have any more of this. We've got to have people presenting at this society meetings who are solving mathematical problems. We can't have this, this applied data analysis stuff. And he didn't use exactly those words. He was quite kind about it. He said, look, it's worthy stuff, but the society will break down if we have talks like this where we present applied anal you know, analyses of data to social problems. And look, I was 23 or something at the time and I got quite deflated I was very discouraged by that. I thought, well, look, if that's the attitude of these people, why would I bother? So I started to disconnect myself from... Uh, but the reality was I needed help at that stage. I'd just been discovering logistic regression and the, none of the standard packages would do it properly. Um, and then I heard a talk by John Nelder a year or so later who was talking about a thing called <coughs> BLIM and generalised linear models. So I talked with a friend of mine in the agriculture department in the biometrics branch, Arthur Gilmore, a geneticist, mathematical ge geneticist, who had a program called REG, or, or REG actually, as we called it. Uh, and we, I was able to use that to do iterated, reweighted least squares to get solutions. Now, the way I, I had to put in a bunch of punch cards in a box, take them to North Sydney, run it, come back the next day, if it had worked, then you put in the next iteration and, so, and you might have eight iterations to get to a convergence. And that's just one model. You can see that the conditions, the environmental conditions, were not particularly conducive to um, doing this sort of thing very much. But at least I was able to use a, a pretty flexible regression program to actually program it to do the, um, the generalised, the iteratively re 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 squares. So 
I was a little bit proud of that, but I, I figured that my professor wouldn't have cared much about that, and I don't think he did, actually. Although maybe, maybe I'm doing him a dis disservice. Anyway, what the sort of thing I do now is try and improve conditions in disadvantaged communities around Australia, and I'm going to come back and talk about this project in a moment, or a little bit later. Uh, so I rejected his advice, and I have intensified my work in the 45 or so, or 50 years, 45 years since that talk, to do what I think needs to be done even more intensively by many more people uh, in this country than currently do it. Uh, and inter interestingly, Tony Vinson as well has continued that work, and that's one of his more recent reports with the Jesuit um, Refugee Service, Dropping Off the Edge, the Distribution of Disadvantage in Australia. It's not a problem we have solved, but we could do a whole lot about it if we got organised, and that's some of my current research. However, I'm going to go right back to the 1970s and the 80s. I want to give you a quick uh, overview of work I did uh, on drinking, the problem of drinking and driving, which was also a growing problem of, pro of some prominence um, in the 70s. In fact, I think 1978, if you look at the graph of alcohol consumption per capita in Australia historically, it was a peak year. And it was a very interesting phenomenon because kind of people knew they were drinking too much and they knew that there were a lot of road accidents that were attributable to alcohol. Uh, and there was a general groundswell of support for doing something about the problem. Uh, now that's a book that uh, was published in New York by Springer out of my PhD thesis which, which was on the problem of how do we deter the drinking driver. Uh, and I, I actually designed a system of mass random breath testing uh, in, that's now used throughout Australia. It was first implemented on December the 17th, uh, 1982 in Sydney uh, as a result of work that I and a few, small group of other people had um, done with the Parliamentary Committee and the Assistant Commissioners of Police. Uh, and uh, it, was quite, it was a very successful intervention, as I'll show you. Uh, as we know, RBT is still really... Um, carried out in the same fashion that uh, we designed way back then. Uh, not done quite as well in Queensland as in New South Wales, but pretty good. Now, this is interesting because um, we would never have predicted this pattern 40 years ago, that road deaths uh, for young males and suicides would be almost at the same rate. That is a rate per 100,000. Uh, and a lot of the reason for this uh, huge decline in the pink graph is not just random breath testing, but that was a very big factor, particularly for that particular demographic. I remember, I think I was an offender on more than one occasion. Not with any pride do I remember that. Now, one of the things that inspired me to um, really look at random breath testing as a, as a countermeasure was a journal that I picked up in the library, physically picked it up and started reading in the library of um, uh, the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge University where I had my first sabbatical. I'd, by this time I'd gone to Macquarie University as a lecturer and uh, in the School of Social and Behavioural Sciences. And um, I picked this article up by this fellow uh, H. Lawrence Ross an American researcher, and what he was publishing was the impact of the introduction of the breathalyzer in the 1960s in the UK using time series analysis. And what he did was one of the first applications of interrupted time series methods to um, a real life problem. Uh, and um, that's fatalities and serious injuries in the UK for Friday nights, midnight, Saturday morning, and so on, the, t the high risk times. Uh, whereas the same graph for uh, the non-peak, uh, non-weekend periods is basically stationary. Uh, and I got quite interested in this because this principle, how could it be that the introduction of a device which police used at a discretionary, in a discretionary way would so massively change behaviour? So I became very interested in this, this problem of how the legal, how law can communicate a threat and under what conditions does that change behaviour. And other people had been in Australia had been talking about random breath testing so I started to delve into that idea and um, 
Uh, I looked at the theory of uh, punishment, the theory of deterrence in particular, and in the classic theory, which actually we still adhere to, uh, if you look at the whole history of immigration detention centres, uh, offshore and onshore, they're dedicated to the proposition that if we create enough suffering in these people who are seeking asylum, they won't, their compatriots won't get in the boat and come here. So it's, it's the doctrine of deterrence, but it's predicated on the assumption that the thing that matters is severity, but also certainty. That is that you know, not every boat will be turned away. Actually, I, I shouldn't keep talking about that issue because I'll get too excited. Let's go back to random breath testing. Um, quickly struck me that the thing that mattered in contrast to what the politicians were talking about was the certainty or the sureness of or the perceived certainty of apprehension should one drive over the legal limit. And random breath testing for a whole lot of reasons which if you're really interested you could read my book and <laughs> find out what they are but for a whole lot of psychological and social reasons it's a terrific instrument or um, a ter terrific technique for potentially changing behaviour. Uh, and so I had a great deal of fun in the early, late 70s, early 80s, actually travelling around Australia talking to different police departments and politicians about this new model. Uh, so tougher penalties on their own never deter crime or, in, or misdemeanour or traffic uh, crime at all, ever. Uh, I don't know how to get that message through to politicians because the first thing they want to do is pass a tougher law, you know, get tough. And actually we've got to call them to account on that. Enough is enough. We now have evidence-based practice in, to a large extent in medicine and in public health, road safety, things we really care about. Because we're punishing other people, particularly black young people, we don't care. Well, we've got to change that. But we've also got to change the rhetoric uh, we've got to call them to account in terms of uh, where's your data, where's your evidence. And I have some ideas about how we might do that institutionally. And I'll come back to that at the end. So there's a random breath test station, uh, I think uh, in Sydney in the early 80s. That's a Queensland ad that you might remember. All designed to convey the sense that you can't get away with it and that you, it's, the, it's the inherent unpredictability of uh, getting caught or whether you will get caught that has the deterrent value. And I did a lot of work uh, which is reported in the book on, um, on uh, what, why it works. It's highly visible, ubiquitous, unavoidable, unpredictable and it is in fact an extremely effective implementation of the principles of general deterrence. So this is a, a case study showing that the doctrine or the theory of general deterrence can be effective and it can be effective in a way that actually does not involve getting tough. In fact it doesn't involve catching very many people at all and I, I kept uh, pointing this out to the police that an index of success is your arrest rate will go down and this was probably the toughest problem the toughest um, argument that I had to put to the police because it, it just was totally contrary to the way they normally thought. There, they always said, yes, we want to create safer roads through enforcement, but we do that by catching the baddies, you know, by arresting people who are speeding or particularly drinking and driving. And of course, it's, it's, the logic is wrong and I argued that this many, many times and eventually they said, okay, we'll have a go at this. And now they can't stop. It seems that with a command and control organisation like the police, once they get this system into their DNA and it is reinforced constantly with the data, I keep coming back to the data, the data are crucial and that's one huge advantage that the road safety field has over many other areas of social inquiry. You have a pretty valid, regularly, frequently collected index of the problem you're trying to solve, namely accidents particularly fatalities and serious injuries and, and they're ac publicly accessible on databases and so on and, and uh, so you've got a terrific database for doing this kind of research and that was one of the reasons that attracted me to that problem uh, when I was quite young. I figured we, I needed a problem for my PhD that was in principle solvable or at least we could, we could have reliable data which would tell us what's going on. Whereas for other crime problems that I'd been looking at, like violence, it was so poorly reported, it's better now, but so poorly reported in those days I figured we wouldn't have any valid index of anything we did. 
So, uh, in fact, I, I don't have any slides on this, but after I stopped work in this area of drinking and driving, I went into the problem of um, how to stop violence around nightclubs. And we did a study after I'd moved to Queensland down in those nightclubs in Surface Paradise. And I needed a valid index of levels of aggression and violence in um, nightclubs. And I wasn't going to use police statistics because for all the obvious reasons. So I recruited students to go in as unobtrusive observers with a standardised observation schedule, which they didn't have in front of them, but they, in a two-hour period they could uh, observe enough as a, as a small group, trained a small group, to, to validly record stuff that was going on, including how many people hit other people, how many people yelled abuse at other people and so on, but also a lot of other practices that were going on in the establishment. And we were able to use those student observations, structured student observations before and after, to show a massive impact after we reformed the um, management practices through a code of practice and getting all the nightclub managers together and saying, yeah, it would be a good idea if fewer people, you know, less blood on the street and on your dance floor would be a really good thing, wouldn't it? And they all said yes, so they agreed to, the, to a whole series of reforms which worked for a while very effectively. Now, I haven't got those graphs because I thought enough was enough, but I just thought I'd mention because that's it's really one of the main points I wanted to make that often statisticians, I think, get their... Like, it's like buying meat from the butcher. You get it all pre-packaged. You didn't have to collect the data, but you're being asked for help to uh, analyse it. Well, I think the nature of the data and the quality of the data and of the measures... Well, it's obvious, but I'll say it anyway... Uh, is, is of such huge importance that I've actually put a lot of my, my life into trying to improve uh, the measures of the things uh, that we then want to use as evaluation tools or for, for modelling purposes. As I say, that sounds trite, but I think statisticians should be more actively involved with their scientific colleagues in the measurement and experimental issues because you'd have a much better idea if you did, if you were able to do that, of the nature of the problem and how to best analyse it. In other words, we need a more robust, we need a, a way, or an environment in which you can have more robust partnerships. And I wish I'd had the opportunity to do that uh, back in the early 70s. Well, actually, I probably did have that opportunity, but what I didn't have in those days was the pipeline to people who could tell me, and particularly provide me with software, as to actually how to do a lot of these things. So I'd never been trained in time series. I'd never been trained in... Um, logistic regression or indeed in any uh, regression applied to any real data. We used to turn the handles on the Brunsvega uh, calculating machines and, uh, and do analysis of variance, but anything beyond that I had to learn myself. Well, and it wasn't easy in those days. I think there's more resources available now. Anyway, uh, now it doesn't matter about the detail of this, but for the PhD I developed a whole theoretical model of how behaviour changed as a result of um, exposure to legal activity, in particular seeing or hearing about or noticing the publicity for random breath testing. And I was able to, through a survey tool that I designed, uh, get a lot of the measures of all of these things. And actually, it worked. Uh, there were the predicted connections, at least at a statistical level, between these various domains of... Um, police activity, exposure to um, police activity, perceptions that people reported of their chances of being caught and the changes in their behaviour that they reported and the subsequent accident rates. And there were other complications in the model, including peer pressure to drink. Um, and it, I could talk about that, but probably don't have time. Uh, so it's a, quite a complex model, but the point is, it, it is a model and... I'm struck by, often even with my PhD students, how many have not thought through some sort of conceptual or theoretical model which would guide the analysis. Again, this is obvious. It's, to me it's obvious, but it's seldom, seldom do I have the opportunity to work with really good students who have thought through all of these steps and where the data analysis can be intelligently guided by a model. Anyway, it's a, it's a dynamic model because time... Uh, occasion n and n minus 1 feed into n plus 1. So it's, uh, it's very easy to, for people to get undeterred. That was one of my conclusions. The data showed it was a very unstable process unless you kept up the publicity and the pressure. That is the visible enforcement. 
which was the argument for maintaining random breath testing after the initial three years. And as I said before, fortunately, the police are a command and control organisation, and once they have it in their DNA, they do just keep doing it. I don't think there's any other organisation in our society that would be as committed to one model for so long, uh, particularly since they find it very boring. <laughs> uh, but um, the reinforcement is the data. So uh, a little later I teamed up with a uh, guy I'd met in WA, John Henstridge, who is probably known to some of you, Director of Data Analysis Australia, a very good statistician. Uh, and uh, we worked on a time series analysis across four states, including Queensland and New South Wales, Tasmania and Western Australia, I think, on the data. And uh, that shows for New South Wales the impact of RBT, uh, December the 17th, 1982. That's, the, that's all serious accidents. If you look at um, single vehicle nighttime accidents, which you could use as a proxy for alcohol-related accidents, it's, it's pretty clear that... Um, there's a bit of a step function there, very precipitous drop. Uh, and in fact, the time series people that I showed this to, including a guy called um, uh, Richard McCleary, an American sociologist who's published many books on time series, looked at this or looked at a graph similar to this and said, oh, that's permanent. He knew from the sort of data he analysed. And, and indeed, it did turn out that this was, to some extent, a permanent uh, and instantaneous impact, which is very unusual. And what John did, with a little bit of input from me, but it was primarily John saying, well, uh, we want to model the effects of the introduction, a short-lived introduction effect, the big bang at the, at the beginning with a lot of publicity behind it. How will you go when you sit for the test? Will you be under 05 or under arrest? With the television ad. Um, brilliant ad campaign, I might say. One of the things that makes me optimistic about Australia is we have a lot of clever people and this guy John Bevins who ran a small advertising agency in North Sydney came up with this. I didn't talk to him but he instantly understood that it wasn't the penalties that mattered. What mattered was the sense of uh, the fear that one would get pulled over and uh, that was what he pushed in the ads quite correctly. So we modelled the introduction effect as an exponential decaying impulse function uh, and then the RBT program effect, uh, which is not related to the level of enforcement, simple, a simple dummy variable, before and after. And then there was the, um, RBT pro the, the enforcement related RBT program effect. And this turned out to be of critical importance, this last component. Uh, and that's the way it was done. Um, and I'm not going to go through that because I don't understand half of it now. I've forgotten. But um, it's, we used daily accident data and I think we used the Poisson distribution which fitted pretty well. Um, well. Of course, we had daily data. We were able to do a lot of things like this that wouldn't have been possible with other data. And the uh, effective enforcement um, had a, an exponential decay function built into it, as well as this idea of a residual deterrent effect, which had been coming out of the criminological literature just at the time, um, with crackdowns, police crackdowns in small areas, hot spots of crime, and people had been noticing these residual deterrent effects after the initial period. So we tried to model that into the um, model here. And so that's the uh, RBT introduction and program effects. Uh, and uh, this is just one of many tables that shows across the states the, the, the impact um, uh, in terms of type of accident, initial impact, duration and estimated number of accidents prevented in the first year. Uh, and um, Tasmania had a small effect but it was really hard because of the small numbers to do too much in detail. Queensland did have an ongoing effect, quite substantial. Uh, New South Wales effects, particularly on fatal accidents, were uh, quite, uh, the initial impact was extraordinary. Um, and if you, I remember, I was there at the time, I remember reading the press immediately afterwards and everyone was astonished. The hospitals were empty, uh, whereas they're normally full at the time of year, at the accident and emergency departments. Um, and this is the last of two, second last of two slides on this topic. 
Um, you can see how the uh, enforcement level in New South Wales varied. There was a spike as a result of a blitz in the mid-80s. But, but the general trend was up, and thank goodness it was, because it um, turns out that there, we could show there was a direct effect between the... I don't know what's happened there with the, <coughs> at the bottom axis, but uh, essentially as the number of... Um, tests went up on a daily basis, the, uh, so you got a corresponding reduction in serious accidents, and that's, that's part of the, the model. Not quite linear, slight bend there, uh, and that was the basis then of recommendations that they increase it even further, which they have in subsequent years. So the enforcement techniques were influenced by the data. Uh, and um, it was an iterative process, of course. So I think this is a pretty good example of where a combination of some pretty good modelling as well as a theoretical understanding of deterrence and um, good data uh, constantly being fed back you know, uh, to the police and to road safety authorities and to the politicians helps uh, to create a virtual cycle, a virtual circle of um, improving practice. Um, but it's very hard to reproduce this in other fields of social inquiry. This is perhaps even unique. So I've said, uh, given my obsession with prevention, science and prevention research, this was probably the highlight of my career, and about, I was about 30 by this time. <laughs> it's been downhill ever since because uh, we had a lot less success on a permanent basis with the nightclubs. Uh, and I gave up on that a few years ago, but other people are doing good stuff now with the lockouts and so on. Um, but now I focus on um, an even tougher problem, which is uh, how to... Um, how to tackle the problem of concentrated social disadvantage and in particular young people, as in Northern Territory, ending up in these hideous institutions where they're tortured, abused and seriously neglected. Uh, and in fact it seems that you can experience the same sort of treatment whether you're an orphan or you're black or you're just socially disadvantaged and you end up in a, as a state ward in a residential institution or you're a youth offender and you end up in a youth detention facility, it doesn't seem to matter very much because the levels of abuse and violence, according to the, to the historical pub, uh, studies that have been published, usually by people who survived these places, uh, is no different. Interesting commentary in our society. Now, this woman, Jacqueline Goodnow, who very sadly passed away a couple of years ago, was the other great influence in my life, it, it professionally. Uh, Australia's most famous developmental psychologist. And to cut a long story short, she taught me to think developmentally and to understand that people are not just a snapshot in time, but they are born and they grow. And, and we can understand those processes of human development. Uh, and they're not all just about the individual, it's also about the environments people are growing up in. And so she gave me a whole lot of conceptual tools when I was working with her at Macquarie University in the 70s and 80s, she and her colleagues, but mainly Jacqueline, um, to, um, to understand how young people got into trouble uh, and then by implication how to keep them out of trouble. And again, and what we've tried to do, and I've got a few slides, time's getting by, we want to allow a bit of time for discussion. Um, I'm going to show you some of the principles we're currently using to work in those disadvantaged communities that are on the map, or some of them that I showed you early on, uh, and how we're utilising new measures and um, tools to try and bring the science of prevention into the practice that people, the practices that our, um, community agencies are adopting to try and keep young people out of trouble. So, so essentially, what I've been working on, although I hadn't thought about it in this way, but after last week's Four Corners program, we're trying to build all of the tools and systems that will assist in jurisdictions like the Northern Territory to actually work in those communities to keep, to divert the pathways from Don Dale to school and to productive employment and to stable marriages. And it can be done, stable marriages and paying tax. Yes, these are good things. <laughs> Much better than living a life on welfare or living in institutions um, run by the state which is not a beneficent and caring uh, body, I'm afraid. So, um, these are the principles, create, that we've developed out of many years of working in a disadvantaged community in Brisbane. 
essentially based on all the mistakes we made. I took the view that I'd been trained in experimental science and I, I figured if I was going to work with people to try and improve lives, promote positive development and keep young people out of prison, I needed to understand what working in a community really involved. So we worked for 10 or 11 years in a particular community in Brisbane and came up with these principles called CREATE, which um, I won't go through. The E is for evidence-based at the bottom, meaning evidence and data and good experimental research on what works is foundational, but also getting in early in the pathway, the other E, to um, head off problems before they emerge. So um, now there's a lot of data around in the early childhood area and there's, we've got this thing called the Australian Early Development Census. It, teachers fill this out every three years. And whether you know it or not, your child at age six or five, five, is um, uh, scored by their teacher on how positive their development is and their literacy and numeracy and all the rest of it. This is not NAPLAN, but this is a community level measure that shows us how young children are going. And of course, in disadvantaged communities, children are not doing as well as in other communities. So those sorts of suburbs I showed you that our analysis identified many years ago in Newcastle, children living in those areas, or the equivalent of those areas today, will be scoring lower on all of these things. And the gap widens as they get older. We've got a lot of data on that. Uh, so how do we reverse that trend? Well, uh, I love that cartoon. <laughs> um, essentially what we're doing now with ARC linkage support is building the tools or the capacity for, for community workers, human services to um, actually do prevention science. Uh, and I, you can't read this, but I'll just read the green boxes. We're developing electronic resources, which are in the form of videos and um, interactive games that measure things validly and reliably, um, and a whole lot of other tools for, pe for these agencies to come together, decide together, plan together, do together, and review together. And everything is driven by data. Um, First of all, data on the needs of children in the area they're working with, which leads them to select a small number of goals to achieve. You can't do everything. Focus, say, on suspensions or disengagement from school. Uh, what are the underlying dynamics that are leading to a high rate of kids being kicked out of primary school? We have a, did you know that more than one child in ten in primary schools in Queensland is suspended at least once? in primary school and it's double that in socially disadvantaged communities. So a quarter of all children in primary school in disadvantaged communities in Queensland are spending a week or sometimes many weeks outside of school because the school says stay out. And that process of prizing children away from the school system is destructive to their lives but ultimately also to our lives as, as a wider community because they're the kids who end up in a lot of trouble. Not always. Risk is not destiny. Anyway, we're building all of these resources and tools to um, empower the people who do this sort of work to, um, as I said, use more scientific and data-oriented approaches to, um, to their work. And we're receiving a very enthusiastic reception for this. In fact, it's not my usual experience that our budget grew throughout the project, the current ARC linkage. In fact, it's three times what we started with. And the, so far, the Department of Social Services, the federal department's given us, I think, more than a million dollars just so we don't stop <laughs> and we keep doing this work. I, I, I take that as an indicator that they're interested in what we're doing, um, including this uh, tool which, um, this game, 30-minute um, video game for five to 12-year-old children uh, where the child's avatar interacts in a strange land, uh, uh, meets a whole lot of strange people, including this creature, Rumble. And Rumble doesn't know anything about human beings, and so he asks a lot of questions of the child's avatar. Uh, and, in fact, he asks 57 questions, which elicit very uh, uh, information about their attachment to school, their social and emotional confidence, their capacity to make friends, to... Um, whether they feel safe at home and at school and in the neighbourhood and so on and so on. And there's also a number of other tasks that they have to go through in the game 
which measure what psychologists call the executive function, things like capacity for self-control, for perseverance, uh, short-term memory, all the things that actually feed not only into keeping out of trouble but also doing well at school. We, my colleague, Dr. Kate Freiberg, invented this because there was nothing like it anywhere in the world and we needed an engaging tool that would be a valid and reliable instrument to measure the outcomes that everybody says are important but nobody has good tools for, for doing. So I just wanted to emphasise again that the, it's the development of the, the tools that goes hand in hand with what you do in terms of the analysis and um, we, I don't think they should even be separated. I, I think they're part of the same conceptual system uh, and it's our disciplinary boundaries that tend to drive these, these processes apart. So, uh, look, I don't have time to go through all of this. Um, we also have a measure of parental well-being, an online tool. Um, I won't go through that, all that. Just mention that we're hoping in the next um, few, five years or so, over a period of years, to randomly in, uh, introduce our systems of support for these agencies um, into, um, uh, in the first wave, eight communities, another, the second wave, another eight, the third wave, another eight, uh, across three states of Australia, Queensland, New South Wales and Tasmania. As far as I know, this will be the first randomised trial at the community level in the human services field that's ever been conducted in Australia. And so far, nobody has said, I can't do it. <laughs> um, Everybody says they want to be in the first wave, um, but I'd have to say, well, if it's random, <laughs> you can't actually guarantee that. But it might be better to wait until you're in the last wave because we'll know what we're doing by then. Uh, but um, my colleague, Sama Lo Choi, a statistician at Griffith, um, has um, given me just the other day a Bayesian paper. I, I was told by Henry Oliver Lancaster, you know, that Bayesian methods are... You don't deal with those people, um, but um, I have evolved a little in my thinking. And so this is a Bayesian paper for exactly this design. It says by iteratively using information as it becomes available in a cluster randomised design, you can greatly improve the um, uh, power and um, sensitivity of this experiment. So we'll, I'll, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. I hope to learn about that. Uh, we're doing data linkage and all sorts of other things that between schools and, and community agencies. No one's ever done this before. That's how we're going to do it. We've got a couple of websites. That's the one. If you want to go and play, um, you can have a look at uh, Rumble's Quest on the www.realworld.org.au uh, as well as some of the other videos and tools we've got set up there. Um, now, to try and finish up, and I've gone for much too much time, I'm sorry. What does all this amount to? It's, uh, you've been very indulgent. You're still, except for one person who's gone, all sitting there listening to me still uh, to talk about my life. I mean, it's really, what could be more boring actually? But anyway, I've tried to distill a few thoughts about what this does all amount to, try and summarise a few of the key points. Well, the first point is about methods, models and measurement and, and I think I've talked about all of those in the, um, in the last 50 minutes uh, but they, they have to be integrated and um, the application of statistical techniques has to be embedded in a theoretical or conceptual framework that derives from those um, models which are not just statistical models but theoretical models. So uh, that's really what I'm trying to say that everything goes together and I've already emphasised the importance of good quality measures and quality data. Now what is this, how, we, how do we do this? Well I am, I, I was not able to maintain my technical skills for very long but I've drawn as much as possible on the skills of very talented colleagues like John Henstridge but also many others closer to hand. But it's very hard to maintain multidisciplinary multi-talent teams in Australia. I think it's one of our great weaknesses compared with the US which we, where they seem to more often have a large-scale implementation of these things. We need teams, multidisciplinary teams that are supported by excellent statistical and IT and other technical resources and of course the sky should be blue and it should only rain at night as it is at the moment. Um, how do we get there? Well, 
I, um, I think it's... Oh, look, I'm not going to go through that. Um, when I, a few years ago, I was setting up a thing called the Griffith Social and Behavioural Research Institute, and one of my visions was we needed some statisticians in there to provide quantitative training in the social and behavioural sciences. And we do have them now, thanks to Tony Pettit, who was on the selection board, and I was able to persuade the university to fund these positions. So, the, going back for a moment to the previous slide, this was a design I had for this institute. But th the bottom line was the development of shared research infrastructure and research skills. So, I, what, what I was, my vision was that we w needed multidisciplinary teams that were going to focus on some serious social problems and actually some big problems that people cared about instead of the usual things that academics study, which are manageable little problems. I was saying, why don't we get together across our disciplines with really good infrastructure and have a go at some of these intractable problems that everyone's actually interested in throwing money at. It seemed obvious to me, but it was closed down by the Pro Vice-Chancellor. But it survived as, as a college, and that's where Samalo Choi is and her colleague and a few other people, and they run workshops and uh, do a whole lot of good stuff, uh, including providing statistical advice, and I hope to have a good discussion tomorrow about Bayesian methods in um, cluster randomised designs. I did mention in the abstract the importance of these emerging intermediary centres. Now, this is an example of a centre from, from Penn State University in the US. The subtitle here, EPA stands for Evidence-Based Prevention, Intervention and Support Centre, Connecting Research, Policy and Real-World Practice. An intermediary organisation stands between the world of research and the world of policy and practice. We have to start multiplying these sorts of um, agencies or units, not, preferably not within universities, but very strongly connected to universities. And I'm in the very early stages of talking to the Queensland Government about creating an intermediary organisation which can be an independent voice promoting and publicising evidence-based practice in the area of crime policy and justice, crime and justice policy so that we can depoliticise a lot of the raging debates around what we do with young offenders and Aboriginal offenders and all, all the rest of it and at least have an independent agency which is strongly connected to the world of research but also very strongly connected to the worlds of policy and practice. It stands between, so it's an intermediary organisation. This is achievable. The government's interested. Whether the money's going to be there, I don't know. This agency, part of the Prevention Research Centre at Penn State, is funded by the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency and has been for the last 15 years under both democratic and republican regimes. And they're obsessed with using evidence-based methods to bring about community-level change. And they've achieved it. They've actually got quantitative measures that show that their iterative systems for introducing community-based preventative strategies with young people have reduced drug abuse, it reduced delinquency, increased attachment to school and improved um, uh, school examinations, high school examination results. And that's attributable to the intervention. So <coughs> this is the US where <laughs> we also hear a lot of other things. But uh, this is achievable. Uh, Queensland is wide open to this. I'm hoping we can create these, a number of these kinds of units across different kinds of areas of so the social portfolio and I want statisticians in them working alongside prevention scientists and others uh, who can um, integrate the evidence and you need your journalists and your web people to get it out there. Uh, and you know, something like a Gatton Institute that can speak to other areas other than economic policy, um, but with a, an authoritative independent voice. So, um, what's the, my thoughts as a final slide, <laughs> future for statistics in Australia, I think it's going to be increasingly decentralised and dispersed. I want to see really good statisticians who know how to do data analysis, who understand the language of people like me, and the sorts of problems we're working with, actually in these intermediary organisations or at least in innovation support roles in universities uh, who are oriented to problem solving. They may need two substanti substantive qualifications. I, I think the days of over-specialisation just in one discipline are over. You, of course, that's the only way you can get published frequently, but we've got to make some sacrifices for the, good of, for the public good. Um, but 
these statisticians need a strong professional network. My experience myself and, more, and observing others over the years, other statisticians, you can't work effectively in isolation. You need your support networks. You need to be exposed to the new techniques, new software, new methods, new... And that takes money, it takes time, it takes effort. And um, but that was, that's part of the vision that I'm trying to realise, both within my own university but also uh, on, uh, within Queensland. And perhaps to some extent the rest of Australia, if, if I live long enough. <laughs> so I'm sorry that's gone so long, uh, but that's, that's it, I think. Thank you.